Hi everyone, I'm Karina Ganters, your host for Behind the Pen. Thank you for joining me for this episode. Uh, today, you know that I'm coming live from Greece. My guest is also living in Greece. So please uh, say a warm thank you and uh, hello to uh, John. Hi, John. Hello. hello. What's your, nice what's your you. full uh, pen name as an author? I just write under my, my real name, John Manuel. Uh, it's a bit strange because I have a rare name, John Manuel, but oddly enough, there's an American author who has exactly the same name, and he's published one or two books about mountaineering and canoeing and stuff like that. So once or twice people have said to me, they've, they've gone looking for my work and found his, and they thought, wow, he does that as well. It's not me, it's somebody else. But anyway, I write under my normal name, anyway, John Manuel. You ever thought M -A -A -N have you ever thought about doing like the a middle initial or something just so that you are totally different from this other author? I, I did put my middle initial in once twice, John P. Manuel. Um, but recently I've just left it as it is because I've now got so many books out um, and a, an author page on uh, Amazon that I think people who are looking for books with the right theme will, will find me okay. You know, so okay, well, that's how I leave it. Let's start right from the beginning. Um, you're English. Yeah. Where were you born? Bath, in the southwest of England. I normally when I don't hear an accent, I know it's it's sort of close to me. Um, I'm from Northamptonshire. Nice part of the country. I, I can put an accent on if you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> I can and, be very uh, west country. <laughs> Where, where have you, uh, why did you move to Greece? Where, where have you lived while you've been in Greece? Well, we moved out here 2005. Um, about two years before that, we were looking at our whole kind of lifestyle and we've never been, my wife and I, materialistic really. We've always preferred travel and experience to material possessions. Mm. And we got to the stage when I was in my early 50s when we kind of thought uh, the quality of life wasn't too good. I was working, running a design studio for a large company as well as working for myself at home with a studio at home. My wife was my business partner doing all the books. Um, and we just felt, we looked at our finances and thought, well, if we just sold up, we could make a seed change in life. And I'd always wanted to write. And I'd started writing my first memoir book before I left the UK, but could never get it finished time-wise. So in the end, we just sat down, did some sums and thought, well, if we move abroad, where is it going to be? Well, my wife's mother was, was Greek, so it was either going to be Greece or France. I, I do speak quite good French, but I did. Now I've learned Greek, I, I tend to speak Greek when I try to speak French. So we looked at our finances, thought if we sold up, we could move back to Greece and see how it went. So we wanted to go somewhere fairly remote. At first we looked at some pretty small islands, but frankly, living on the tiny islands is very idealistic, um, but not very practical. We ended up on roads purely by accident um, because of some friends of ours back in South Wales, where we were living at the time. We'd taken them to Greece about eight, nine years before that. They'd never been before. They asked us if we'd go to Greece with them because we knew the ropes. And we went with them and um, they fell in love with Greece as people do. And then uh, after a few years of going on their own, when we were talking about moving out here, it was rather odd because uh, I spoke to, he's, he's also a John. And I said to him one day, by the way, we're, we're thinking of selling out and moving out to Greece. And they had a lot more money than we did, still do as it happened. But uh, they said, well, that's odd because we've just decided to build a house on roads. Oh, wow. And so I said, I said rather as a joke, uh, well, if you want caretakers, give me a shout. And about a week later, he phoned me up and he said, yeah, we should talk um, because I, the house is being built off plan. So they built it with our own apartment, effectively assembly attached bungalow for us to look after the place for them. So we did all the gardening and maintenance for them for the 14 years we were there. But last summer, well, this summer just gone, July, um, they decided, um, even they hadn't expected to do it, to be honest, but they decided to sell it up. And because we'd always kept the money from our house uh, to one side, we're very careful with money, always have been. Um, we still had a, a chunk of capital, so we thought we can't go on renting now because although they were paying us to do maintenance, but we were paying rent. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we thought if we spent the capital, we could just live on our bills 
paying bills without any mortgage, rent, whatever, we could manage better. So because I'm now a pensioner, I know I don't look at it, of course, he said modestly. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't tell a look in the mirror. But anyway, um, we decided that we could survive better by buying a place. And Rhodes, after 14 years living there, frankly, is too expensive. We couldn't afford to buy much in, in Rhodes. Right. We came over here four years ago to Irapata to stay with some friends who live in the town. Fell in love with the place. We so love it. And four years on, as it happened, when John told us he was going to sell the house, um, we were already planning to come over here for a visit. So we brought the visit forward until August, came here and looked at properties, um, not fully expecting to find anything. Mm -hmm. But on the fourth day, we found this place. And you know, sometimes you just look at a place. You know. And it speaks to you. And this little house said to us, I'm your new home. <laughs> and that's how we ended up here. So you rent, in, offer. you rent in the house Sorry. where you are now? No, we bought it. We're, we're in the process of buying it. As it happens, as you know, the bureaucracy here is terrible. Paperwork. Um, we're waiting on a notary, but fortunately we were able with our lawyer to, to make a, what they call a prosim volume, which is a pre-contract agreement, whereby we pay the seller a, a part of the, of the purchase price and he allows us to move in so we've moved in made the place our own we've been here about four or five weeks now oh not long but we still have to sign the contract but uh, you know so wait on the notary you still get in uh, settled in if you've only been there about a month yeah i mean we have because it's quite small and we didn't this is one of the reasons we liked it we looked at some houses uh, which were awful and they required so much work on them mm. and with us still living in roads it would have been a uh, a nightmare we'd have had to have a project manager and all the rest of it this place apart from a little bit of um, painting changing the color of a couple of walls okay. it was ready to move in wonderful so we thought it was a little bit more expensive than some of the other places we'd seen but still a modest price and we just thought it's uh ideal really um and it's got this patari, which in, for the British people don't know what that is. It's like a gallery. You know what the Greek houses are like. They have a gallery which often serves as a bedroom. Mm. It's above the kitchen. And it's become my office, which is where I'm sitting now. Useful. I can probably just pan a bit. Uh, if I just, can I change cameras on here? I don't know if I can. But if you can see behind me, hang on, I can put it that way around. You can see this is my sort of office area. Nice. Um, and uh, I'm sitting at my computer desk, which is, I'm turning around a bit now, which is here, there's my Lovely. MacBook, and there's the window out into the roof. And then if you pan right round, you can see mm. below me the lounge area. Oh, how lovely. That's so sweet. Yeah, and the kitchen is beneath me. It's right beneath That's where I'm sitting. Perfect. And we have a very nice veranda out there, which is really what sold the house to us, because the, the house is almost, you might say, I'm just getting myself up here just the house is almost like a little chalet, but the veranda is beautiful. It's huge and it has a wonderful view. So, so I mean, let's face it, you spend... Sorry, couple. Sorry. Such a cute place Sorry? for a couple. Say that again, I didn't That's catch that. such a cute place for two people. Yes, yeah, it's compact and bijou, <laughs> but it's exactly what we need. It's, no, it's plenty big enough for two of us and um, it's on the edge of a beautiful village. The local villagers have made us... So welcome, giving us yeah. you know food and fruit and olive oil and all that kind yeah. of, and also feeding me with raki. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, I was writing lots when I was in the UK, but I didn't actually get published until I was in Greece. Is that the same as you? Your first publication, whether it was um, non-fiction or a novel or a book, or whatever, did that happen after you moved to Greece? Yeah, I'd half written, because I was a big fan of Bill Bryson, and I also read Peter Mayo's Provence books many years ago. And rather immodestly reading Bill Bryson, I thought, I could, I could do this, you know. <laughs> so I started work on the first book, which was um, the history of how I met my wife, and my wife's mother was Greek, and all the rest of it, and how we came out to Greece to visit my wife's family in the 1970s. And I called it Lella's Daughter as a working title, because my mother-in-law's name was Eleni, but everyone called her Lella. Mm -hmm. um, and my wife obviously was Lella's daughter um, and I got about halfway through it but I was so busy in the UK I could never get it finished when we moved out here within about a year and a half I suppose I finally finished it and uh, self-published it under the title Feta Compli which I rather liked because I spelt it Feta Compli obviously because the Greek connection 
but it's the French expression, which kind of meant, yeah, done and dusted, which we, we'd done. We moved out to Greece, settled. It was a fait accompli. And I had one person, <laughs> one bright spark who, who read it early on, who wrote to me saying, um, you should have spelt it. And they'd give me the French spelling, <laughs> F-A-I-T, accompli. I thought, hang on, I don't think they quite get it, you know. Yeah. That is the Greek piece. Anyway, that was the first book. And then after that, I wrote well, three others in the same series, which were episodic books. Um, Moussaka to my ears was the second. Uh, Tzatziki for you to say was the third. <laughs> and then a, a plethora of posts was the fourth, which was... I love the title. More like a, yeah, a plethora of posts was basically about 40 chapters from posts from the blog I'd started out here, which I'd amended slightly and turned into the fourth volume. So I called it the Ramblings from Rhodes trilogy in four parts. <laughs> oh. um, and each one, when they first went on uh, Amazon in the Kindle format, um, I was absolutely astounded because for the first two or three years, certainly when I got to the third one, they were the top sellers in Greek nonfiction for about 18 months on, on Kindle. That's amazing. Which was phenomenal to me because I, I self-published. Um, and I use the blog. Isn't it? It's a niche. You found your market, yeah. especially with yeah. the roads being about Greece. Um, you mm. found it, you found the niche and you, you took it and that, that's probably why. That's brilliant. So yes. what happened yeah. uh, after, after that uh, series? What did you move on to? Well, I, I, I'd always wanted to write fiction, but never thought I could. I, I really thought I didn't have it in me. But then... For some strange reason, about, um, I don't know when it was now, I published the first novel, um, The View from Cleobulus, it's called, because Cleobulus is a, uh, he was the ruler of uh, Lindos on Rhodes 500 years before Christ, and his supposed tomb is out there on a headland. It's called mm -hmm. the Tomb of Cleobulus. And so I called it The View from Cleobulus, because a lot of the action took place right by the tomb. I had an idea uh, for a plot based on a young couple I'd known in Cardiff 30 years earlier. And uh, something happened in their lives, which just presented the germ of an idea for the plot. So I thought, well, I'll have a go. I'd never written fiction before. Somebody who'd read my first book, Fête Complete, and not actually liked it, but in their review, they'd said, I like his writing style. I think I'd prefer it if he wrote fiction. Um, and of course, you don't write in the same style when you're writing fiction as you do when you're writing memoirs. But anyway, I started piecing it together, and eventually it came out. and. The early reviews, fortunately, were very positive. Um, again, most people that read, you don't have to be a Greek fan to read my fiction books, but if you are a Greek fan, it adds something because obviously most of the reaction takes place in Greece. You'll stick into the historical uh, time and dates and uh, events as well in, in your fiction. Yeah, I mean, the first um, four books of fiction didn't have too much, well, one did actually, uh, Eve of Deconstruction, the third one, that required a little bit of a continuity chronologically because it referred to um, a British woman finding her Greek roots and then going back to a village in uh, mainland Greece and the history of the village uh, was a little bit involved. So like, for example, oddly enough, coming to this village, talking to a, an old couple that lived in the village the other day and the, the old man Yorgos was telling me how electricity didn't come to Makrilia until 1971. And it was similar to the village I sort of created for my character in that book, Eve of Deconstruction. So from that standpoint, yes, the only book that really required chronology to be important was the last one I published this year, which is called Panayota, which was a work of uh, labor of love for me because although it's fiction, it's, uh, I drew heavily on my wife's family's experience to create the story because it begins between the two wars or, or just before the second war in Athens. Mm. where my mother-in-law actually lived and my, my wife's grandparents had a taverna in Plaka in Athens between the wars and so does my heroine in the book. So there's a lot of in, things that happened in, in my wife's family that I borrowed from. So that one required a little bit of chronology. The other ones, not so much. But, um, are you yeah. saying, is it a romance? Is it a thriller? What are you, what's the genre you're writing in? Well, they're mainly human interest stories, all of them. Things that happen to people that they didn't expect. I, I like the first one, View from Cleobulus. Somebody rather, I thought, I felt quite flattered, termed it Thomas Hardy for the 21st century. And I was a big fan of Thomas Hardy when I was younger. I read all his books, as most of us do when we're 
you know, late teens, early twenties. And all his books are about humans, uh, the human condition, if you like, aren't they? And how people often are destroyed by their past. Um, something comes up later in their life that you'd forgotten about earlier, like the mayor of Casterbridge, he sold his wife in the country fair. Decades later, it all comes back to destroy him. And there's, there's a bit of that about, I think, all the books, um, apart from Panayotta, which is um, the, the, the heroine, she's, she moves to the UK after the war, marrying a British soldier, which my mother-in-law did. My father-in-law was a British soldier in Athens at the end of the war. They moved to the UK and she had a secret which she had to keep all of her life. And she was, the book begins with her in a hospice in Bath where she's on a deathbed and she has a story to tell and she wants to tell this story before she dies because nobody knows it. Nobody else knows the facts. There's nobody else left. This is based on her true story. It's a, it's a novel, but there are bones in the novel which do equate to my wife's family. I, I, that's how I put it, because I, I don't want anyone to feel that it's, um, it's actually the story of my wife's family, because I've changed a lot of aspects of it. But the actual bones of the story, if someone reads it and thinks, a mm, bit improbable, no, it's not, because it happened. The actual, I can't say anything about it being a spoiler, but what happens in the story happened in my wife's family but to different people then in a different way. But it's, that's what gave me the inspiration for the book. And I wanted to also put across what it was like for a young teenage girl living in Athens under the Nazi occupation. Because my wife's mother died in 1984 uh, it, at 57. Um, my heroine lasts until she's in her 80s. Mm. And I only found out because I was an idiot then. I was a young Englishman not interested in history. After my wife's mother died, and in more recent years, having moved out here, I found out what happened in Athens. I read the book called Titch, which I've actually put on my um, blog and website as a recommended book for people to read if they, well, actually it's in the introductory comments in Paniota. Mm. It's available on Amazon. And Titch is a story of a young Greek boy that was an orphan in Athens during the Second World War. Uh, he was living off his wits, nearly got, shot in a firing squad several times because he was caught by the Germans with the resistance. And I learned a lot from him about the conditions in Athens during 41 to 44, which I'd never learned from my, grand, from my mother-in-law because I never asked her. And mm. she was a, such a happy person. She was a very positive woman, um, always smiling. Uh, she had a terrible life really until she married her second husband, which was quite late on. Um, and I was stupid enough not to ask her to tell me her story. So I had to find it out after she died. That's and this is why I wrote the book to some degree. Sorry? That's what research is all about, yeah. Yes, yeah. So I went, you know, I went Googling and I went uh, back to my wife's family's history. And fortunately I found this thing that happened in the family, which I thought, wow, that would be a great, um, uh, how can you put it, twist. And it is oddly enough, oddly enough, uh, several, most, of, most of my novels have twists in them. And most of the people who read them, according to reviews on Amazon, say they didn't see them coming. But you'll always get one, which really annoys me. And they all say, I, I knew what was coming. I could see it coming. Yeah. And it, it does annoy me a bit because I read, as you probably do, I'm an avid reader. I read all the time. I don't think any writer cannot be a reader. And I have read five guessed twists. But I look at it this way. If you guess a twist and you get it right, you think, bingo, wasn't I clever? But you could just as easily have got it wrong and then it would have surprised you. And I have found in the books I've written, 90% of my readership say the twist caught them by surprise. So those people that say, I saw it coming, well, okay, I'm glad for them. But I wonder whether they were just lucky. <laughs> <laughs> if you give too much away and they caught on to it and they were too clever, yeah. So was this another series? Did you have a name for this or was it just individual books? Yeah. Apart from the first two, the novels are standalone. The second novel, which was called um, A Brief Moment of Sunshine, is actually a prequel to the first because one of the characters in the first novel, um, I don't explain fully why she's like she is. And so the second novel is basically her story. Um, it's the only one that has probably 50 to 60% of the action in the UK and the rest in Greece. Mm. All the rest are like 70, 80% of the action takes place in Greece, but there's still a 
deep Greek connection with it, um, which the reader will see. But again, hopefully I'll put in a few twists that the, the readers wouldn't see coming. Have you, have you noticed from your reviews that uh, your readers have been Greek? Have you noticed from the names? I got a few Greek readers, but I think the vast majority of my readership are people that follow my blog, follow my, I, I have a Facebook page I began about three years ago now, maybe longer, called A Good Greek Read. And I started it because I was looking for some Greek reading material, couldn't find any, uh, one source for it. So I thought, why don't I start my own Facebook page? And all the, the idea behind it is each member of the group posts a link to an online um, website where you can purchase either an electronic version or a paperback of a book that has a, a Greek connection, whether it's uh, factual fiction, whether it's Cyprus or Greece. We've expanded it to include um, web articles and magazines and stuff too now, blogs, oh. any reading material. And I've now got approaching 3,000 members and it's really fun and I've got a lot of authors who are on members who write books on a Greek theme and they're at liberty to publish information about their most recent work on there as long as they don't overdo it no, um, yeah. but it's great fun and um, most of my readership that I think are British people that have a Greek love affair you know they love Greece and they come to Greece for the holidays and they want a, they want a book to read on the sunbed and I think that's probably the core of my readership. But I do have readers all over the world, I'm pleased to say. I, I, I was amazed once. I, I used to do excursions in Rhodes as a part-time job, taking tourists out on a coach or, up or on, a, on a boat. And one day a, a lady spoke to me on one of my excursions and she said, um, you are the John that wrote uh, uh, this book, aren't you? And I said, or writes the blog, Ramblings from Rhodes, as it used to be. I've got a new blog now. Concrete, but anyway, I said, Yeah, oh, she said, I was so pleased to meet you. I thought I might meet you coming to Rhodes. I've been following your blog for years oh, and I've read your books. Me. And she lived in Australia, so I thought, Wow, you know, the, the internet is an amazing thing, isn't it? Especially if you're like me, an indie yeah. author isn't with no publicity machine. Yeah, oh, wow, that's amazing. I, I remember when I used to have so much confidence, I've lost all that now, years ago. Um, my, my husband works in a bar, so I used to go round to all the customers with my books. Would you be interested in, you know, I used to do, you know, signed copies. And, and once mm. I went to, um, I was working for a doctor's surgery and I had to go and pick up some uh, paperwork, insurance paperwork of a patient. And I went round this swimming pool and there was four people had their book, my book, in their hand around the swimming pool. And... Oh, Nothing wow. like that has ever happened before, and it was just so, yeah. it was so surreal to see that, you know. Yeah. I, I had this <laughs> one person come into the bar and say, um, my, my husband, my boyfriend nearly drowned today because I was so engrossed in your book, I didn't see him having cramp in the wow. oh, So you could have been responsible for a death. <laughs> oh, so, no, I'm so flattered. <laughs> I mean, at the, end of the, at the end of the day, any writer, however you know amateur however private however independent whatever the whole point of writing is for someone to read it isn't it of course it so is. if you if you if you find somebody actually reading your work it, it is it's so so gratifying and um i love it when people contact me through my website i, I, I get messages through my, i got a contact page on my website and people write and say i hope you don't mind and i think mind i love it I, you know because it's um, proof that someone's out there. Yeah. <laughs> reading the stuff. I don't go out looking because I've got 13 titles. And I don't go out going on every day to Amazon looking for new reviews. But when I come across them, it's wonderful. Because, I mean, before, and, and new authors unfortunately think that reviews are the bee's, bee's knees. You know, you need them, you'll die without them. Well, that's not the case. But before, I used to press all the time please you know once you've read it please leave a review now yeah. i don't really give a damn if they leave a review or not but it's mm. really nice to, to see that when when i don't expect it you know yeah yeah now i, I tend to agree I, I was the same i i used to get a bit hung up about reviews um the last couple of years i haven't really bothered much um at the end of the day you know that probably 80 90 percent of readers don't bother to review they don't um, if you yeah. ask them in the book It'll only take mm. a second for them to do it. Um, they don't realise how much it means to us to read uh, what they think of our book. 
but um, most of them don't. I mean, I'm, I'm probably the same if I read a book. I probably wouldn't bother going on to review it. Um, there's no reason why I wouldn't, whether I like it or not. Um, it's, it's just something that's uh, been instilled in readers, you know, why to bother reviewing. But knowing when you get that sale, knowing that someone's bought your book, knowing that they're going to eventually read it, whether it's uh, in that pile of books on their Kindle and they'll get to it eventually, or they've bought the paperback and you know they're going to read it on holiday or whatever. That's what we need. We need to know that people are actually buying the books because yeah. that's an incentive for us to carry on writing and publish mm. more of them. Are you self-publishing all your titles? <coughs> yes, I mean, I, I, it's strange really. I, it's nice, the idea of having a publishing deal and having a bigger audience and maybe making a bit more money out of it. It would be nice. I'm not saying it wouldn't. But on the other hand, it is quite nice having complete control. Exactly. Um, because I know from people I've spoken to who have had um, the publishers and agents take them on, they get often told that there are certain changes they have to make, whether it's language or whether it's sexual content or whatever. And uh, I always figure, I mean, maybe I'm old fashioned, but George Eliot and Thomas Hardy, frankly, even today, John Grisham. You never see an F word in his book. You never see a sex scene in his book, but he's one of the top selling authors on the planet. If the story's good enough, you don't need all you that. Should, you shouldn't need to resort. I mean, I've read some of Alan Titchmarsh's novels, and I, I think he's a great TV presenter, and I'm a, quite a fan of his gardening program. <laughs> I don't rate his novels very highly, to be honest. I, I think they're a bit twee. Yeah, the novelist. And yeah, and yeah that, they are almost chiclet, as they call it. <laughs> um, but I read an interview with him and he actually said he's embarrassed about writing the sex scene, but his publisher said he had to put the sex scene in. Well, if, if a publisher said to me, we'll give you a deal, John, and we'll, we'll put it out into all the bookshops uh, across the UK and Europe, whatever, but you've got to put a sex scene in, it would depend a huge amount on what they asked me to put in, whether I agreed or not. You know? And whether it because I, the book, whether it was Yeah, me. and I don't. I really don't believe that a good story needs it. And uh, the reviews I've had from most of my readership tend to suggest that they don't. And I've had a, the nicest thing you can read, and I've had fortunately quite a few people say this. They say, they contact me or they write a review or they contact me on my, I got a Facebook page called John Manuel, The Published Works as well. And I have quite a few followers on there. And they say, I bought your new book, John, to read on holiday. I'm going in, May to Corfu or whatever and then they put another comment on and say oh I couldn't wait till then I read it <laughs> uh, <laughs> when's your next and they say when's your next one coming out and I think well that's there's a lot of work involved in writing a book but I'm really pleased they want to read another one so it is yeah. a lot of work I don't think uh, readers say they, they buy the book they read it and uh, they enjoy it which is wonderful um, but they don't realize how it's not about just the writing we have the editing process, which is a nightmare. We have the costs of cover, editing, formatting. Um, we have to do our own marketing and promoting. Um, there is a lot of work when it comes to writing and publishing a book. And um, I think the more readers that, that know that, uh, the more appreciative mm. they'll be of us because yeah. we go through all that well, for them. We do for them. Yeah, that's very important actually because um, I've read a few reviews, um, a couple of reviews, I mean, my, mainly my um, memoir books, the first ones I wrote, the vast majority of reviews have been very encouraging and positive, but you get one or two that are quite insulting. Mm. Um, I think one guy put, just put a one word review of one of my books on Amazon. I can't think what it was now. It wasn't a swear word, but it wasn't far short. And I thought, why did he do that? And my, I, my view is, if you don't like a book, fine. May, maybe express what you don't like about it in a civilised manner. But what gives anybody the right to throw insults at an author because they don't like their work? If at the end of the day, like you just said, if they considered the amount of blood, sweat and tears that goes into a book before it ever gets out into the public domain, at the very least, they should spare a thought for the feelings of the writer. I mean, I've read books I thought were useless, but I wouldn't go online and say this is trash. I might say I found it disappointed me slightly or whatever, 
But more often than not, I don't bother to review a book I don't like. I just don't do it because I think I don't want to affect other people. If I can you know, get, no, and I certainly don't want to upset the author. If I can get in touch with the author, then I will message them on Facebook and, and tell them the problem I had with it and, and why I haven't left a review, rather than go online publicly and, and slam them. There's no way I would do that because, like you say, we know what it takes to finally get that book out. Yeah. One good thing, one good thing someone did say to me, and it did help me a lot, actually, I got upset a little while ago by this one review. I think it was that one where this guy just put one word. It was something like um, total, two words, total trash, something like that. I don't know what it was. Mm. But um, I made a comment. I put a video on YouTube or something saying how I felt. And someone said to me, John, um, don't worry about it. Because A, the vast majority of your reviewers give it four or five stars. And B, it proves that you're not rigging your reviews. Because it is true that some people get all their friends to review their books, don't they? I've, I've and been so, told that if you have one or two stars in your review packet, that it makes you look more legit than having yes. five stars going all the way through the... And it's yeah. strange. I mean, but I'm a bit... Apparently that's I mean, I'm, yeah. I mean, I hate to be conceited. And I honestly am not that kind of person. But I am absolutely amazed that my most recent one, Paniota, on Goodreads, um, it's got about 30 odd uh, ratings and about five reviews. And about 28 of the ratings on Goodreads give it five stars and the other two give it four. Mm. And that's the only thing that worries me. I think, I wonder if people think, you must know all these people. I don't, I only, but maybe three of them I know, but only through writing, not that they were originally my friends. They're people that I've come to contact with through writing. Um, <clears throat> but. I know, I, I, you almost, it's a terrible thing to say, you almost wish somebody would give it a bad review <laughs> because that way you, you do get that balance. Yeah, yeah you it's do strange, get isn't it? balance, but I wouldn't want a bad review. It, this I've, isn't I've had vodka, I've stars reviews in, in nearly all of my books. Um, this, this person uh, is another author, actually. Give me a, a two-star review. The review was fantastic. He loved the book. He loved the characters. He said the writing was brilliant. He gave me a two-star review because he said the cover didn't relate to what the book was about. Oh boy! Yeah, the cover has won based awards. on the cover. The cover has won awards. It's so good. Yeah. It is. And you can't with yeah with covers as well. You can't please everyone, can you? I mean, it's just crazy. The cover, no, the cover yeah. was perfect. There's nothing wrong with the cover, and it mm. it told people straight away what they were going to get when you look at that cover. I mean, mm, yeah, covers mm. are very, very important. They say never judge a book by its cover, but a book is always judged by its cover. That is the first mm. thing that catches the reader's eye. And if you yes. don't get that first, then they're not going to mm. bother looking at the blurb, which is the second. And after the blurb, it's the reviews. I think that is so important. I, I am with you with that 100% because I look at... Um, Amazon quite often you know you look at your own book and you'll say it'll say people who bought this also have bought this yes. or other books in the same genre and you always know the self-published books because invariably they've gone and done a cover amateurly and it looks like it's been done by a O-level student or GCA, GCSE level student um, if a cover if a cover doesn't look professional it tells the potential buyer straight away that it's self-published and but I've read some reviews about self-published books where they say that all self-published authors are crap and yeah. all the rest of it. And I thought, how wrong they are. There are some we brilliant to, books, not to get myself accepted. Bad rep. Yeah. I mean, I've read some books with major international publishers that are useless, horrible books. Terrible. And it's the luck of the draw, isn't it? And yeah. mistakes. Yeah. They, 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 so, can, and there are lots they, they can pick up, pick up our book and point out any uh, grammar errors but you get a five star from the from the, the top five best-selling book and you will find mistakes in the text you will find yeah. it and they go yeah. through like 10 different editors with these uh, big houses yeah. and we're just we're just Believe independent me. authors and you know but we're the ones that get slammed for it but when Amazon but there, I mean, first came out with the kindle and ebooks were allowed by every single person who wanted to write a book Oh my God, every single person wrote a book. And that mm. gave the people like, authors like us, 
that know what they're doing, a professional, want to do it as a career, and are good at what they're doing, a bad reputation. Yeah. But since then, mm. we've built that up. We, we, we've now get in a good name. Um, mm. Self-published authors uh, are being offered uh, contracts. Um, Self-published authors are making more money than some of the, the, those with publishing contracts. Um, mm. we, we're definitely, definitely um, mm. getting a better name for, for ourselves. But going back to the covers, you can find a book with the best beautiful cover. And of course, the cover attracts and it's your genre you want to read. You go out and buy it. But the story or the writing or whatever inside is terrible. Yeah. The cover was fantastic. Mm. And that's what made you go out and buy the cover. So it's yeah. both ways. Mm. Whether mm. Yeah, true. I mean, I, I've read a couple of books recently. But I suppose you'd put them in that sort of um, slightly uh, arty genre where, where, where everyone falls over themselves to say, oh, what brilliant prose. When in actual fact, the story is useless or very poor. But for some weird reason, it's a bit like the Emperor's New Clothes with arty things, isn't it? <laughs> Nobody wants to admit that it's useless. And some, I, I read a book recently, I can't think what it was called now, but it, it won an award, one of these literary awards. But when I finished, well, I, you know what happens with a lot of books, like Louis de Bernier's Captain Corelli. For the first two thirds of that book, it was hard going, heavy going. But when you got towards the end, it came a light. And by the time you finished it, you thought, what an amazing book. So you can read rubbish books and you get to the point where you think, well, it, it's, it'll pick up, you know. <laughs> you hope it does. And then you get to page and it hasn't picked up. And then I think this person has a contract. And I think, wow, I, well, it is. It just shows you, you must not judge just because something is an indie author. You have to go by a lot more than that. Um, and a lot of indie authors, I read a book, again, I, I lose track of where I am, a couple of years ago now by a guy that was self-published like myself. Um, and his, the book I read was published by a major publishing house. And he said an agent had rung him up to offer him a deal because he'd found his self-published paperback in a second-hand bookstore. He'd gone there browsing, came across this book, self-published, read it, thought, this is brilliant, and got in touch with the guy and he got a publishing deal and he sold millions. So I, I suppose just waiting for this to happen. <laughs> it happens to, <laughs> to one, it can bit. happen to another. You know, it only takes uh, the right person to read your book. Mm. I mean, I, I had somebody read uh, one of mine. Um, it's an MC thriller. It's a vigilante. Uh, something you wouldn't be. It's very violent. Something probably you wouldn't want to read. Um, but anyway, I had someone uh, contact me and uh, ask to uh, write the screenplay. And they have um, people in the know and they have people in their circles. So who knows in 10 20 years if that's gonna get on the big screen we're mm. always waiting for that big break as independent mm. authors and all we can do mm. we just keep on pushing keep on writing keep on promoting and marketing our books and one day it will happen that's what i believe to be honest as well whilst i do agree with that i'm quite in some ways quite happy people say to me why don't you submit why don't you submit well in the past i did send some submissions but knowing how difficult it is to get through the snow of submissions that arrive at agents and author and publishers desks in the end I give up because it's just too much hard work because at the end of the day I looked at my lifestyle and I thought I am actually not unhappy although I yeah all of us could do with a lot more money but in actual fact my wife and I have a nice little life we exist okay I get gratification from the feedback I do get. So if I never got a publishing deal, it would not upset me that much. It would make me happy to get one, yeah. but it would not upset me. As long as I have an audience out there, and even though it's very small, I do have an audience. There are people that wait for my next book to come out, I'm pleased to say. That's good. And uh, I'm gr grateful for that. And I, I absolutely love my little readership, you know. Um, but obviously, like your interview today, I'm very grateful for it. It gives me an opportunity to perhaps reach a few more people. Uh, mainly, as I say, my readership will be Greek or files, but having said that, the published, the, um, the fiction books don't, you don't have to be Greek or files to read my fiction books, you just have to like a good story, hopefully. So, mm. yeah, well, so, so I'm happy either way. Let me know, uh, what are you working on now? At the moment, I have uh, not come up with a good enough idea for another fiction book, um, although I have got something just beginning to hatch in my mind, but I'm working on a book which 
as, as the working title, The Novices or the Beginner's Guide to Greece. And it's very much tongue in cheek. It's not meant to be um, a guide, oh, yeah. serious guide. It's meant to be a, a, a humorous guide to all things Greek to the person who either already is a Greek apart or doesn't know anything about Greece. Um, and I look at everything, uh, culture, geography, flora and fauna, religion, everything about Greece uh, in a different section of the book and address it hopefully from a humorous angle this so that people will get a chuckle. My big fat wedding, um, because I was living in Greece when that came out and I literally peed myself laughing so much because I saw everything that they were doing was so traditionally Greek like when they were sitting on the sofa and the sofa had the cover over it. The yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've everyone's got friends saying, just like that, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. They're true, oh. you know. They think they, they didn't go over the top. They, they, mm. didn't, they just showed you what traditional yeah. Greece was like. And it was just yeah. so funny. And I think if you can do a book like that, mm. and get that you across. Know, yeah. You know, my favourite scene in that, in that movie, uh, and it is because my wife and I are vegetarians, and it is different in Greece to what it was, but it's still, to most Greeks, a complete puzzle why anybody would be a vegetarian. <laughs> and that scene where he's talking to his... Well, I do like, lamb, no problem. Yeah. You're vegetarian, no problem, I do lamb. <laughs> yeah. well, like, we've had this. We, we've had this. We got invited back to Sophia's house back on the roads some years ago. Been out, we've been out with her in the morning, and... So we came back to her house and she said, I'll do you some, uh, some, some rolls, some bread rolls for lunch. Okay, we'll, we'll wait. She, vegetarian? Yeah, vegetarian. So she, she served that um, ham salad roll. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of meat. <laughs> yeah. L lunch and meat, thinking that we were, that was okay for vegetarians. Uh, and, and recently we got invited, well, recently, a couple of years ago now, we were invited to an older couple's house for lunch and we forgot to tell them. That we were vegetarians and she cooked a beautiful uh, chicken and vegetable casserole. Now in situations like that we would never choose to eat the meat at home and we wouldn't order it in a restaurant but in situations like that we're the kind that rather than upset poor Poppy that had laboured over this meal all morning we would eat it. Now there are obviously some vegetarians that would say ah oh, horror that's not us okay um, so from that standpoint, there's no way I could, I could upset that poor woman who, who spent all morning cooking that food for us. Um, and our attitude is it's not going to kill us to eat it once. And so we did, you know. But, but she but did not out of choice. So you could have just had the roast vegetables. <laughs> yeah, but it was in a casserole and she dished it all up in dishes, you know, like deep dishes. Oh. Um, and to be honest with you, we've, we've not got a huge aversion to chicken. <laughs> there's a funny story that how much time we've got left. But um, some years ago, we haven't been on roads for long. And uh, my wife said, well, maybe I'm not too averse. Now we live in Rhodes. Um, we have some friends that have chickens. They're all organic. Maybe it wouldn't be such a bad thing if we ate chicken now and again. No other meat, but maybe some chicken. And at that time, the bird flu was sweeping across Europe. <laughs> and it came across, yeah, it came across to, to Turkey. Mm. And then the next thing, our friend Michali, who's the, he comes up in my books quite a lot, my, my non-fiction books, because he's got a lot of um, animals and birds. And he due to precautionary measures all the people on roads had to kill their chickens and get new stocks in because of the bird flu so my wife said oh no let's forget it let's forget it so we never did we never did go back to eating chicken i'm i'm not partial to to red meat i actually prefer eating chicken than, than any other red meat myself and lamb that's just easter time so i don't know if i could ever go vegetarian though but, uh, yeah, I mean, we don't get we don't get you know, upset about people that eat meat. We we do tend to say if we talk about it, maybe we should eat less meat. But we're not the kind of people that will you know chew people's ears off about eating yeah. meat. That's their choice. We have our choice. They have their choice. That's wonderful. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, John. Um, your book sounds amazing. Um, I really enjoyed it. Thank you for the opportunity. You're very welcome.